Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, and welcome to Global Atheist News. This week's headlines. A victim has been awarded £1.4 million damages over historic abuse by monks. In Italy, an abuser is still working as a priest. The US Supreme Court rejects New York City teachers' religious exemption appeal over the vaccination mandate. Australian MPs stand up for right of freedom from religion, and they speak of the divisive nature of the religious discriminations bill. In Pakistan, a man accused of blasphemy was killed by a mob. North Sembilan awards 21.18 million to mosque officials and religious teachers. A pastor resigns after incorrectly performing thousands of baptisms. Religious artwork was removed after a local priest and businessman were found among the holy images. A man who was abused by monks at a school in Fife, Scotland, run by Christian Brothers, has secured £1.4 million in damages. It is believed to be the highest sum ever to be awarded to a survivor. The victim was sexually assaulted and beaten by three Christian brothers while staying at St Ninian School in Falkland, Scotland, in 1980 and 81. The man, who was named in courts as A.B. to protect his identity, said he hoped his award would inspire others in their quest for justice. A year ago, the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry, being conducted by Lady Smith, said St. Dinian's residential school had been a place of abuse and deprivation. Lady Smith said children suffered physical emotional and sexual abuse, and she described the evidence as shocking and distressing. She also concluded that members of the religious order were able to pursue their abusive practices with impunity. In 2016, two former teachers at the school were jailed for a total of 15 years after being convicted of the physical and sexual abuse of pupils. Former headmaster John Farrell, 73, from Motherwell, was jailed for five years, and Paul Kelly, 64, from Plymouth, for 10 years. The High Court in Glasgow heard that their victims were aged between 11 and 15 when they were abused between 1979 and 1983. Another monk, Brother Ryan, died in July 2013 before he could be investigated. While at the school, the victim, A.B., said he was raped, molested and beaten by all three men and was forced to watch attacks on other children. A.B. said that brothers Kelly, Farrell and Ryan commonly targeted children from a dormitory that they referred to as the favourite boys' room. The monks would also frequently play the record Ashes to Ashes by David Bowie during their attacks, a song that continues to elicit harmful flashbacks for their victims. A.B., who is now 54, admitted he kept his past secret from his wife and daughter until he opened up for the first time in November 2013, when he spoke to police officers, he said, I just broke down in tears. Until then, I'd been living in my head for 30 years. I used to hide all my emotions. If there was something about abuse on the TV, then I'd go to the toilet and hide so no one would see the reaction on my face. The Christian Brothers Order, which ran St Ninians at the time of the abuse, tried to have the civil action thrown out, as the death of Brother Ryan meant they could not investigate A.B.'s allegations. 
but Sheriff Christopher Dixon dismissed this argument and ordered the Christian brothers to pay 1.39 million in damages in recognition of the lifelong impact on AB, including on his ability to work. Welcoming the court decision, AB said, when it comes to justice in cases like mine, people often ask things like, it must have been worth the wait. I know what they mean, but no, it's never worth the wait. Not when you remember why we've been waiting. I'll always feel the pain. I'll always have flashbacks. The BBC has uncovered how a culture of complicity and denial conceals the true scale of clerical sex abuse in Italy. One shocking case that was delved into exposes how abusers in the church can escape justice. The BBC interviews Mario, not his real name. He pulls back slightly as the interviewer holds out to shake hands, but it is still clearly uncomfortable with physical contact. At the interviewer's first question, how are you? He immediately breaks down. This interview is taking me back to it all, he stutters, barely able to get the words out through his tears. Mario has never before spoken to a journalist about what he calls his sexual slavery at the hands of his childhood priest. He is one of the countless stories of clerical sex abuse in Italy, which has never properly confronted the scourge. Despite having the highest number of priests of any country and the seat of the Catholic Church in his backyard, Italy keeps no official statistics on the issue and there's been no public inquiry. In the shadow of the Vatican, Italy's sins are hidden beneath a veil of darkness. Of course, I was told that it was a secret, Mario recalls, between him, me and Jesus. That secret was, Mario says, 16 years of horrific abuse that he endured from the age of eight, carried out by a priest named Father Gianni Becchiaras. A summary of the case by Mario's lawyer, which include many details too graphic to report, describes the first rape in 1996 as premeditated. Becky Aris reserved a hotel room with one single bed for them both. Afterwards, the papers read, Mario was left in pain and bleeding, crying silently. Becky Aris late, later gave Mario's parents a gift of a poster showing where the hotel was and where the rape is said to have taken place, under which he'd written the date and time of that moment, as well as the words, in the memory of the two days we spent in the cold of the mountains. It was, it seemed, a warped commemoration of the crime and a sign of how the priest manipulated the emotionally vulnerable child, profiting from Mario's strained relationship with his father. As I grew up, he asked my parents if I could go and sleep at his house, Mario remembers. They agreed even though I prayed they wouldn't. His parents, unaware of the horror unfolding, were naively proud that an important man of the cloth would value their son. The trauma led Mario to drugs, psychological collapse, and repeated suicide attempts. See this video of when the BBC confronted the accused priest. Siamo dalla BBC. Eh, sì, abbiamo parlato con, eh, con il ragazzo che l'accusa di abuso. Eh, è giusto che continui a lavorare come prete? La ringrazio della sua sollecitudine. Chi è il ragazzo? Il ragazzo che l'accusa di aver abusato per 16 anni. Ci sono, ci sono le documentazioni di un processo con i suoi esiti, vi chiedo di... Ce, ce l'ho, ce l'ho, eh, ma sta, sta continuando a lavorare con i minori, eh, violando il processo canonico. No, io lavoro qui e non ci sono... No, minori. ma ho, ho delle foto, per esempio, con lei e minori, per esempio questo, questa, questa messa e un'altra pure qua... 
con un minore. No, qui c'è, c'è, c'è gente, non ci sono minori, ci sono persone. Ma, ci sono, eh, ma lei sa che la sua vita è stata distrutta di, da lei. La prego, la prego di informarsi bene. E io ma lei ha, ha messo la, 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 la responsabilità nel, can, can, nel processo canonico o i documenti del processo canonico. Allora fate, fate tesoro dei vostri documenti. Ma lei è un pedofilo? Questo è quello che dice lei. Grazie del vostro lavoro. La, 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 la vittima. Arrivederci. The Supreme Court on Friday shot down an appeal from a group of New York City school teachers who sought to block a COVID-19 vaccine mandate, arguing it violated their religious freedom. Justice Sonia Sotomayor rejected the emergency appeal on Friday, the same day as the deadline for city employees to comply with the mandate or face losing their jobs. Sotomayor did not offer an explanation, which is the court's usual procedure. The appeal was filed on Tuesday by 15 Department of Education workers who claimed the city was violating their religious freedoms by not accepting their exemption claims. The city requires that religious exemption requests must be backed up by religious leaders. For example, the teachers said the city would not accept an exemption from Catholics because Pope Francis had urged his flock to get their shots. The appeal came after numerous objections to former Mayor Bill de Blasio's vaccination mandate for teachers had been struck down. Back then, the city did bow to the teachers' union to allow exemptions for medical or religious reasons. But new Mayor Eric Adams said this week he would go ahead with terminating nearly 4,000 of the city's roughly 400,000 municipal employees who had not been inoculated against coronavirus. Australia is a very secular country that doesn't offer feature in global atheist news, but today we have two videos about the proposed religious discrimination bill. They want freedom from religion in Victoria. See this video. And as someone who has experienced discrimination in my own life, both professionally and personally, I know how important the principle of equality before the law is. And I know how important the principle of freedom of religion is and freedom from religion, especially in a secular democracy such as ours. That's critical. We must have not only freedom of religion, but freedom from religion. This means that Australians should be be free to practice and adhere to their faith, just as Australians should be able to not follow a faith and be free from any repercussions or discrimination on that basis. In relation to the freedom of religious belief and expression, I do want to make the point that this has always included the right to hold no religious belief whatsoever. We should remember that some of the most harmful prejudice in history has been from people of religion towards people accused of having no religion, being essentially regarded as godless one way or the other. And that includes Indigenous peoples the world over, and it certainly has included the Indigenous peoples of Australia. Deputy Speaker, I'm not religious. I respect the right of people to follow and express their faith. At the same time, those who are not religious deserve the same respect in return. And they don't want the community divided. See this video. Yesterday, the Prime Minister spoke misleadingly and wrongly, of this bill being unifying. This is far from the case. This package of bills has always been a cynical exercise, much more than any attempt to reach any unity. It's an exercise in promoting division. It is simply awful that he is content for the rest of us, the rest of the country, to be divided and pitted against one another now at his behest in this national debate at this late hour, all in the name of a political win for himself. Good legislation comes from listening. Good legislation comes from patiently working through the issues. Good legislation does not divide the community. 
and we know we are facing an epidemic of mental health issues. We should be very, very weary of doing anything that could possibly exacerbate what is already a very dire situation. But instead of focusing on that, we are focusing on a way to make it more divisive, more difficult for some of those young people. I fundamentally believe, and I believe my whole adult life, that this nation needs to find points of unity, points of commonality, points of agreement, more than we do points of disagreement, points of division, points of fierce argument. But I think this parliament's in danger of, um, if we, with this legislation, of making the wrong call of actually dividing the nation, not uniting the nation. The objective of the faith groups I have spoken to is to secure protection from discrimination, a shield, not a sword to discriminate against other Australians. Instead, the government's bill pits one group of Australians against another group of Australians, against the next group of Australians and so on, against each other. Rather than unite the nation, this bill is now dividing the nation. A mob has killed a man for allegedly burning pages of the Quran in central Pakistan, police say, in the latest case of blasphemy-related violence in the country. Police say that more than 80 people have been arrested in connection with the killing on Saturday in the district of Karniwal in Punjab province. Reports say the man was in police custody before a crowd snatched him. His body was handed over to his family and a funeral was held on Sunday. Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan said the case would be dealt with the full severity of the law and asked for a report on police officers accused of failing in their duty to save the man. His government, he said, had zero tolerance for anyone taking the law into their own hands. Police official Manawa Hussain said officers arrived to find the man, reportedly in his 40s, unconscious and tied to a tree. The villagers, armed with batons, axes and iron rods, killed him and hanged his body from the tree, Mr Hussain said. The federal government of new country, Seremban, has allocated 21.18 million of their local currency to mosque officials, including imams, muezzin, and religious teachers in Nejeri Simbalan this year, said minister in the prime minister's department, Datuk Idris Ahmad. He said of the total 12.8 million was allocated to 4,034 recipients, comprising imams, the mosque caretaker, religious teachers, as well as the Quran and Fadu Ain teachers in Negeri Simbalan. Idris added that the government has also allocated 140 million for infrastructure projects involving Tafis and Pondok schools registered under the Department of Islamic Development, Malaysia. In another development, he said that the issue of deviant teachings in the country was still under continued monitoring with the cooperation of the state's Islamic religious department. If there is news of such teachings on social, social media occurring in the country, immediately inform the Jahim and we will channel the information to the authorities for further action, he said. The pastor of a Catholic church in Phoenix changed one word in administering the sacrament, rendering baptisms performed there invalid, the church said. The Reverend Andres Arango was leading a baptism at St. Gregory Catholic Church in Phoenix last year when people in the pews heard a slight variation in the religious ritual. 
we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Father Arango said, his voice echoing in the church as he poured the holy water. But there was a problem. Saying we baptize was incorrect. The Vatican instructs priests to say, I baptize. And if, if it is not said that way, the baptism is deemed invalid. Church leaders investigated and determined last month that Father Arango had incorrectly performed thousands of baptisms over more than 20 years, meaning those he had baptized in Phoenix and at his previous parishes in Brazil and San Diego were not properly baptized. The oversight has caused headaches for those now seeking answers about whether their faulty baptisms have spilled over into other elements of their Catholic faith. For instance, would it affect those who are married by the church? Maybe. Unfortunately, there is no single clear answer, the Diocese of Phoenix answered. Father Arango, who did not respond to calls on Sunday seeking an interview, apologized in a statement and said he was resigning as pastor of the parish, effective February the 1st. In the Catholic faith, a baptism is a sacrament in which people, often infants, have water poured over their foreheads, symbolizing purification and admission to the church. It is a requirement for salvation, according to the diocese. A religious work of art has been removed from an Italian basilica after a local priest and the businessman who commissioned the painting were found depicted among the holy images. The painting was gifted to the Cathedral of Canossa in Puglia, southern Italy, but caused controversy upon further inspection. The image featured the boss of the charity, which commissioned the 17,000 painting of St. Sabinus meeting St. Benedict, as well as the priest who runs the cathedral. The artist wanted to portray two authoritative representatives of community, he said. People shared their own reproductions of the artwork online, featuring other famous faces inserted into the canvas. Now, normally I would hand over to Free Thought Hour, my interview show, but this week it's a special fundraising event in aid of recovering from religion organization. Many of my previous Free Thought Hour guests have agreed to drop in and support this worthy cause. It will be starting in a few minutes and running for three and a half hours. So please stay tuned to this channel. Come and chat with us, bring your friends and donate to Recovering From Religion. The GAN team will be back with our weekly news review next week. Please like, share, subscribe and set the notifications. This has been Global Atheist News. Thank you for watching.